preach God's word to us. Let's go to the Lord together and pray. Gracious Lord, we are so blessed to be here, to be a part of the assembly here in Covington, God, and to see the great work that you're doing in our community, Lord, and we just pray to continue to learn as our pastor teaches and preaches to us that we might be equipped to go out in your name into a world that's lost and dying and to show them there is hope in your name. God, I pray you'll anoint our pastor, that he'll teach your word to us, that you'll touch his heart, and that we'll leave this place transformed by the power of your spirit and your word. In Jesus we pray. Pastor Chris. Praise the Lord. Make the Lord good. Praise the Lord. Excited about it. Sister Greasy, you've done a good job, awesome job, with that beautiful lesson. Boy, that's a tough job. A tough or tough lesson. Jesus talked about loving your neighbors yourself. Man, that's hard. He talked about forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Right, right. Sound me like he knew what he was doing. That's what we say. He, uh, he knew what he was doing. He knew all the time what he was saying. But Jesus said, go ahead and forgive them anyway. As they, you know, God, they don't know what they're doing. No. I don't think, he didn't mean they didn't know what they were doing. He meant they didn't understand. They didn't, they didn't comprehend what they were doing. You see what I'm saying? So he's done an awesome job. It's good to see everyone. He's good to have Stanley. And Brandy back today. Stanley back today to get up kicking. I always tell him, Stanley, if you're not kicking very high, get up in a, on a chair. That gets you to about two and a half feet higher. So, but be careful. Get on the chair. Be, be very careful. Good to see you, everyone. Go to the book of Philippians. You would, chapter two today. And uh, let's see what the Lord has for us this morning. God is so good. God is so good. Appreciate the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 5. I believe is where I want to read. Let me put that. Let me get that up right and see if he is, looks like mine. That's it. I believe that's it. Sometimes I can't even read my whole life. And it's bad when you can't read your own title. That, that's when it's really bad. Uh, but in this case, that's what it was. Praise the Lord. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I have a, uh, here several years ago, I looked back in my computer and I, I seen here several years ago, probably 10 years. I talked about this. Uh, I want to preach a, just, just a few minutes, just a few minutes on the cost of the cross. Bow your heads and let's pray together as they play. Go ahead, Rebecca. Father, bless the day. Bless the Lord. I pray God will minister in this service this morning. But we need you to that. Oh God, you're great. God, there's hungry souls here today, Lord. God, we ask you, God, what I need you today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Help us to realize, Lord Jesus, what you've done for us at the cross. In Jesus' name. You lift your hand to the Lord and Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, and let it be a sweet. Thank you. I see hands up everywhere. Just lift them on up. Let me see some more hands. I see hands going up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you today, Lord. Sweet, sweet spirit. God bless you. You can see it. The cross was very, the cross was very costly. Sometimes if we're not careful, we'll just kind of get the, get the idea 
It, it was just the death of, a, of the cross. It was, it was a lot went on prior to the cross in Jesus' body as He gave Himself. I was looking at a video on the, on the YouTube thing and uh, it, it showed how that the cross, how that the whip was made and what, how it was used at the, uh, at the uh, whipping of Christ before he went to the cross. How, did it, uh, how did they, they, they put together a, we call them a cracker, on, on the end of a whip. The whip uh, wasn't, it looked like it was about three foot long and, and had a handle and it was bones and little fine pieces of, of metal uh, weaving together inside of that cross and it was designed and I didn't at this part I didn't know it and it had some little stones looked like about the size maybe of a quarter uh, or maybe a little bigger uh, in that also and, and it was designed to literally break the flesh when the when the Roman soldier would use the cross or the wheel when he would hit the back of whoever it was that he was the whipping, it was designed to cut and the stone was there to literally break the skin and burst it open and, and go all the way in through the flesh to the, <clears throat> to the actual bone of the side and of the back. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, you know, uh, it, it cost the Lord a lot before he ever even went to the cross with that kind of suffering that that, that was designed to, to give and to put upon a human being uh, that, that was a, an awful, awful pain that he had to go through before he ever got to the Calvary's hill and then when he got to the cross or, or to the hill where he was to be crucified then he was nailed to the cross. Now, you know, if you read any amount of commentaries at all, you'll find several different stories and several different of opinion of how that went about. And how they, if they nailed it through his wrist or did they nail it through his hands or, or did they nail, how, how did they nail it? And, and this and that. I, I have no idea. All I know is what the Bible said. The Bible talked about the nail scarred in his hands. Now, I, I don't know how anybody could be so narrow-minded as to confuse a hand to a wrist. I mean, anybody just about, that you know, would tell you that a hand is not the wrist and the wrist is not the hand. And so if the scars are in the hands, then I'm going to say he didn't have the nails through his wrist. He had them driven through his hands and, and then he was literally stood up uh, on the cross and stood up and, and the story I, I read, this particular story said that the cross was designed to be, when he was there, it was designed that he would be at eyeball level with the crowd that was there and that they would literally be where they could walk by and spit on him or slap him or whatever they so desired, he'd be at reach for them. And and being they had stripped him of his uh, apparel, then he was he was shamefully treated there in front of everybody with his clothes had been ripped off of him. And all this was taking place for the reason of our sins. It, it wasn't for anything else. Uh, the scripture says he died for our sins. And it was because of us that he had to go through this, that he did go through this. It was because of my sins and your sins and the sins of the whole world. Uh, that was the price he paid for salvation. So the cross was very costly to the Lord. It cost him everything he had. I read a story that said right after Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo, the story said he met with some of his leading generals to, to look over the battle plans and find out what went wrong and, and checking out all the flaws and get strategies and so forth and so on. And the story said in the course of his discussion 
that he was discussing with his generals, this little general, the story called him, pointed at, a, at England in the colored map before them and said, except for that red spot, I would be the master of the world. And my, my, my idea was Satan could say the same thing. If it had not been for the red blood that was shed at Calvary, he'd be the master of the world. But I just come to tell you today that he's not the master of the world and it's because of Calvary. If Jesus Christ is the master of this world, he gave his life that you and me could be saved. He Right outside of, the, of Jerusalem, on the, of down on a hill called Calvary, right outside the walls there at Jerusalem, there was a red blood stain, Brother Jimmy Crum, uh, that, that was there, that was the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, and Satan could look, and he could say today, if it was not for that red spot right outside the walls of Jerusalem on that cross. If that blood hadn't have been shed, I could rule this world. But thank God that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed and that he don't rule this world and that we've got a master called Jesus that rules this world and I'm going to tell you he's coming back and going to take his church away one day real soon. And I want to be ready, don't you? So, I'm sorry, I got, somebody said, I got my tang tongue. And uh, I'm just glad that Jesus is the ruler. Few of us really understand the actual meaning of the suffering of Christ and his death on the cross. I think a lot of us don't understand exactly what he did go through. That he went through a whole lot as I tried to explain to you. If, if I could see it, if I could understand it, if I could comprehend it really, like it's supposed, like it was, if I could get it in my mind, what Jesus paid, the price He really paid for my sins, I'll just use me, okay? That way I won't get you all up time. If I could just realize for myself if I could see it, Johnny Pruitt, if I could really see it, I'm not talking about just hear about it, if I could see it, if I could visualize it, if I could get it in, in, my, in, in my peanut brain, the suffering that Jesus actually went through and the price he actually paid for me, I do believe there'd be less conversations we'd have with the devil. I think mean, we'd be a little bit stronger in Jesus and I think we, we would be able to face the devil a little bit better if we could comprehend the thing that Jesus actually did at Calvary for us. Our weakness would become stronger. Our desire would become greater. Our dependability would be better. We'd be a better church member. We'd be, oh, you're not here. You don't want me to preach. You'd be, a, you'd be, a, you'd attend church a lot better than what you do. You'd be here a lot more than what you are. You'd be a whole lot more faithful to the house of God than what you are. You'd be more dedicated to the cause of God than what you are. If you just get a vision of it, if you get in your brain what Jesus done for you and what he done for me, I'm going to tell you, honey, the preacher would have to pop the door open. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean I have been sick, y'all, and now I'm not sick now, but I have been. And I know my head is, well, I, it ain't never really been good. But it really ain't good today, I can tell you. Somebody said, I'm back to normal. I said, well, that's strange. I ain't never known you know. Anyway, we can't comprehend it, Brother Jim, what Jesus actually did for us. What Jesus went through. We, we, we're too human. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. I'm talking about nobody comprehends it. It's incomparable. Yeah, that's close. 
It, it, you, we don't comprehend it. We can't, we can't imagine in our mind the sacrifice that He actually made on that hill that day. We can't grasp the cross of Christ, what it was really like. The atonement for our sins and, and, and salvation. I try every day. I can't say I do it every day, but I try every day. I try to thank God for, for mercy that's renewed every morning. If my Bible's right, it's renewed every morning. And then I try to thank Him for grace that brought salvation and teaches me to live godly in Christ Jesus. And then I try to thank Him for Calvary where my sins were purchased. The price of my sins were paid at an old rugged cross. I try every day those three particular things. I try not to forget to thank Him for it. I'm going to tell you, if we ever see it, ladies and gentlemen, I used to hear my old pastor, Brother Dwayne Herring, I used to hear him preach until he couldn't hardly talk. And he'd tell us, I've heard him say it many times, that if you could get a vision of hell, you wouldn't even go home this afternoon. You'd stay in this altar all day long. If we could get a vision of it, ladies and gentlemen, whatever... Oh, Come on, praise. Oh. It's only when we know the cost of something that we begin to appreciate it. When we know what it cost. It was even Abraham, I believe. I believe it was Abraham. When Sarah died, he took her for burial, trying to find a place to bury her. And when he found it, he offered the man, he told the man that owned the place, the piece of ground, uh, that he was what, what he wanted with it and said I'm going to bury my wife and I'll pay the full price for it. Was it Abraham? And the man said look here Abraham said no problem man you just go ahead this is my language you go ahead and take that plot of ground and you bury your wife right there it won't cost you a penny. He said no uh -uh, I'm not, I'm not going to do it that way I'm going to pay the full price. Uh, let me tell you it's only when we recognize the value of something uh, that we can appreciate what it costs. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That I can recognize the value of souls of your soul and your soul and yours and yours. When I can recognize the value of those souls, then I'm willing to pay the full price for it. And when Jesus looked down and recognized the value of me and the value of you, Datron, he said, I'm going to pay the full price for him. Don't want a cheap shot. It's only when I can recognize the value. Yes. See, if you give me something, it won't be a, it won't be long. It'll be dirty and rusty. All right. All right. But if I have to pay for that dude out of my pocket, yes, yes, then it becomes a lot more valuable. You understand? Yes. I've got a wit rock. I didn't hear know what a whip rock is. Yes. A whip rock is something sharp with a pocket knife. Yes. Brother Jim, it's about that long. I can't even hold, I, I can't even sharpen my knife when my friend will cut my thumb. That's how short this little whip rock is. And it's thin on one end, it's paper almost. On the other end, it's not much thicker. You know where that whip rock came from? It was my daddy's whip rock. And you know why it's so thin on one end? Because the, if you had the other half of it, you'd find it comes in and it's, and it's thin in the middle and thick on both ends. Why? Because he's sharpening a knife. You don't understand what I'm saying. And it ain't worth a plug nickel to nobody but me. It's worth everything. It's sitting in my desk drawer. I just keep it in there for whatever the reason. I don't use it. I look at it every now and then and my daddy's whip rock. When I recognize the value of it, it becomes special to me. And when Jesus recognized the value of you, what you were actually worth to Him, that He was willing to pay the full price at Calvary. Uh, 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 it's, it's only when, I, when we recognize that do we appreciate it. The value is, goes up as we recognize 
uh, the, the, uh, the, the value of something. Uh, and, and it's a greater investment when we recognize the value. Jesus did not die because of the nails. The nails was not what killed him. It was not the nails. Do you anybody remember reading where somebody said, if you're the Christ, come down? Right. Anybody remember reading right. that? And you know what? And does anybody remember reading that Jesus said something like this? This may not be word for word. He said, don't you know I could call 10,000 angels? Man, what an army. If one angel could put 10,000 to flight, what do you think 10,000 angels could do? You know, I could call him. And he said, but for this reason I came into the world. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? It was not the nails they didn't even hold him on the cross. It wasn't the nails that killed Jesus. It wasn't that whip that I that I tried to explain to you what it looked like. It, that, that's not what done it. It wasn't the spear that, that they took it and shoved it into his side and out come blood and water. I read something about that too. Uh, you know what? I, the, the article I read, you know what it said, Brother Mark? It said when water and blood came out together, it was a sign of a broken heart. Yes, sir. That ain't what killed him. That's not what, that's not what put the finishing touch on him. That wasn't that physical abuse that killed him. My Bible said in Hebrews 2 and 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the offering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. It was the love of Jesus Christ for mankind that took him to the cross and that took his life. When we get a view of that, when we get a view of the real suffering of the crime, we can't understand, we can't even understand salvation till we get a real view. That's why a lot of people, you can ask them, well, what do y'all believe down at that church? They ain't got a clue. You know what? They ain't got a hold of it yet. We'll maybe at least tell them something. Uh, they just haven't got it. it when, when we view it, when, when we get a, a view of the suffering of the cross, we can't, until we do, we don't understand salvation. We don't, we, we misunderstand uh, uh, until we understand. We don't, we don't tell them comprehend it until we understand what Jesus did on the cross. God through the, and we only come to God through the new birth. You can't come no other. I don't care what them idiots tell you. I don't care. Some of you watch that idiot on, tele, or on your television. I'm going to tell you, you don't need to watch him to start with. No I'm being personal. I'm being a nosy, a old nosy old preacher, and I, I don't care what you call me. You don't need to listen to nobody tell you there's a way to heaven outside of Jesus Christ. If he does, he's an idiot. He's a false prophet. himself through Moses in the Old Testament to Deuteronomy. He said, A prophet shall the Lord thy God rise up of your brother like unto me, and him shall you hear. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hear that prophet, I will require it of him. You don't need to listen to some dodo tell you that there's another salvation plan. There's not another salvation plan. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you, to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. And he's calling today. The Bible said that the spirit that that bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, we may also be glorified together. We will never understand that if we don't get the cost of the cross. Clap your hands to it. Hard mind, whatever. I can't help it. I'm draining. I'm fixing to quit. Here about 20 minutes. <laughs> Hebrews 9 22 said, and Bob, and, and uh, almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of the blood, there's no remission. You can't go to heaven if you don't go to Calvary. Right. Brother, Don, brother uh, from Corinth, Mississippi. 
H.O. Duncan, pastor at Calvary Pentecostal Church in Corinth, Mississippi. I went to preach him a few nights, we did, years ago before I came here. He said, Brother Creasy, we're sitting out under his carport after we eat a big chicken dinner. We're sitting out there in a chair, all kicked back, man, rubbing our old belly. He said, Brother Creasy, he said, if you stay around here long enough, you're going to hear a lot of people say, or a lot of people that say, I said, that you can't go to heaven if you don't come to our church. I said, okay. He said, but that's not what I said. I said, well, what did you say? He said, I said, you can't go to heaven if you don't go to Calvary. <laughs> I said, amen. You've got to go through Calvary. Remission means forgiveness. Listen carefully. I'm sorry, but I have to slow down. Jesus came, became our substitute. He went in my place. For an example, listen, if I forgive someone a debt, I have got to be willing to suffer the loss of that debt. Missed it. You missed a real good place to jump up and squeal. Brother Post, if you owe me $150, and I say, you just forget it. It's all yours. Then for me to really forgive that, I've got to be willing to suffer the loss of that. Right, yes, sir. Does that make any kind of sense? Yes, I'm not sir. willing to suffer the loss of that $150. I will never forgive the debt. Right. And if I, if you hit me right square in the mouth, understand me? I know you would never do that, but if you did, <laughs> And I said, that's okay, Brother Stanley, I forgive you. Uh -huh. And I've got to be willing to suffer the blow of that punch right. to right. forgive you. Right. I can't say I forgive you and going about my own way and say, you're going to do it again. <laughs> if you do it again, I'm going to get me a stick. That, honey, that's not forgiveness. No, sir, no. Forgiveness is when you willing to suffer the loss of whatever it is you're you all clap your hands up because that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. He forgave. Down the cross, he said, Father, forgive me. They don't. You know what he was saying, Bob? He was saying, I'll suffer the, the, the punch of this situation. I'll take it on myself. Forgive right, me. Right, I hope right. to their joy. Yeah. That's yeah. what Jesus did. Down the cross. He was willing to suffer. If I forgive a blow, if I forgive you punching me, I've got to be willing to, and, and, and to, to suffer the blow of that punch for you. God, I, I've got to be willing to say, don't worry about it. Now, I ain't going to say that I'm man enough to say if you want the other cheek there. I ain't going to say that. I'd like to think I could. But I think I need to pray a little more. <laughs> but I've got to be willing to do that. Justice requires that every offender be uh, 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 in, under the old law. It was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I did not know that. I didn't know that this was really what this was speaking of until I read some things on this. It was willing. It was under the law. It was. It was to say, if I punch your eye out, then it, I got to be willing to let you punch mine. An eye for an eye, a two for a two. But under Jesus' day, what Jesus did, Jesus forgave us. Forgiveness relieves the offender. When I say, I, when I say, Stanley, I, I, that hurt, but that's okay. I forgive you. Then you're relieved of that situation. God don't hold it to your charge. I forgive, so you forgive. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And and that's what that's what forgiveness is all about. And that's what Jesus did at the cross. He forgave me. He forgave me all the debt that I owed him. Every time I transgressed his word, every time I said a bad word I shouldn't have said, every time I smoked a left-handed cigarette I shouldn't have smoked, every time I drank a can of beer, every time I took a shot of whiskey, every time I transgressed, Jesus forgave it all. He was willing to let it all go. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He told the woman at the well. He told, excuse me, it wasn't the woman at the well. It was the woman the Pharisees brought to him taken in adultery. 
He said, neither that. Where's your, where's your offenders? Where's your, where are your, uh, your condemners? Where are they at? What happened to them? They were standing here a moment ago. What happened? Where, the, where did they go? Somebody probably said, hey, Lord, it was that rock ordeal you got them with. It was that ordeal, Lord. You said, uh, uh, you know, he said, get down here and write Leroy right here and JJ over here and John here and Mary here and, and, and then draw me a line underneath it. And I get back up and I say, okay, I said, now, you that's without sin, he's got your name right over the ground. You, you don't know he wrote that. Well, you don't know he didn't. He wrote something. I don't think he wrote Mary had a little lamb. I think he wrote their name. That's what I think. I think he wrote their name. And then he said, now, if you don't have a sin, you, you cast the first stone. And he got back down and wrote outside John this, and he wrote outside John that. And he wrote outside uh, 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 Stanley this, and, and Roger that, and Jimmy Crom this, and, and he wrote all that. And then he gets up and he wrote that. I want to be heard in Brock City. Nobody's that. He looks at the woman. He says, woman, who are those thine accusers? What, where are the men that brought you here? Did any man condemn thee? Under the law. Under the law, there had to be two or three. At least two. One could do that. At least two or three that would say, I saw it. I know it's right. She done it. She's guilty. And then she was guilty of death. Here she stands by herself. I mean, just standing there, you know, just as guilty as, just as, guilty as, uh, as Bill Clinton. <laughs> you see, standing there. He said, where are those? He didn't ask, are you guilty? He said, where is your accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. <laughs> These are the words we all love to hear. Neither do I condemn thee. But he didn't say, go on about your way, did he? Go and sin no more. Hallelujah. The penalty was paid when he stretched out his hands at Calvary. And he gave that price. The price was high. It was a high cost. It cost him, it cost him a lot. For millions and millions and millions of people on our earth today, it was too high. They'll never, they'll never accept it. They'll be, they'll be lost. Millions of people, your neighbors, your brothers, your sisters, your family, some of us will, and will, millions will be lost. They used to sing a song. Uh, some have started out today. Some finally made it all the way. But some will never know just how heaven's going to be. Sure, there's giants in the land, but victory's numbered by the sand. I'll never, no never, forget what Jesus done for me. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. For millions, they'll never make it. <laughs> millions of church people will never make it. Millions of mem members of churches will never make it. Sitting on pews every day. P buildings packed out today, much, much, much larger than this. B buildings probably two and three times larger than this is packed out today. Do not, do not know the meaning of Calvary. They're listening to somebody stand in a pulpit and tell them a lie. Right. Now I'm not implying I'm the only one preaching the truth. Don't you misunderstand what I'm saying. That's far from the truth. And that's not what I'm trying to, to give you today. I'm trying to tell you though, outside of Calvary there's no remission. Outside of Calvary there's no forgiveness of sin. You can't go to heaven unless you go to Calvary. You cannot make it no other way. Amen. And so we're preaching today that it was uh, it, it, it had a high cost to it. Jesus paid the full price. And to many today, it was it they rejected. I've heard people say it's a bloody salvation, a bloody, a bloody cross, and it is. It is. Without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission of sin. Uh, the Bible tells us that that uh, uh, it, it or teaches us that if if there had not been a Calvary, if Christ had not, if he had, remember that I quoted to you a while ago. Somebody said, you, you know, I'll come down off the cross and we'll believe you. Remember reading that in your Bible? I mean, remember reading that something of that sort. Come down and we'll believe you. If he had come down, brother Mark, listen to me. All of Abraham's seed would have been lost. be on their way to hell without the shedding of the blood there's no remission didn't matter if you're Abraham's seed don't matter if you're a deacon on the deacon board it don't matter if you're a pastor it don't matter who you are if you don't go to Calvary you'll be lost 
if you don't make your way to a, to a cross, uh, uh, can, can we cry out today that we are willing to pay the price that Jesus wants us to pay? Uh, the, that he loved, he loved the, uh, he loved Nicodemus. I mean, remember reading about Nicodemus? He loved him. How about the lepers that Jesus cleansed? He loved the harlots that he touched just by, just by touching his hand. I could tell you story after story uh, about a church in, in the Pentecostal church uh, in Memphis. Uh, now it's, it's not called the Pentecostal church now. Uh, well, well, maybe it is. It maybe wasn't called the Pentecostal church then. Charlie Mahaney preaching revival. I think I told you about it. A lady came up and, and she had, 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 uh, had all the features of what she was. She was, uh, she was a prostitute. Came off the street. This was in White Haven. Came off the street. Came down to the front. Brother Mahaney said he could tell she was wanting to speak to him. So he walked down there and she said, I am a prostitute. And I need God. Just like that. God filled her with the Holy Ghost. He loved souls. He loved different, different tax collectors. Man, you got to really be something if you love a tax collector. He loved tax collectors. He, he loved everybody, Brother Jim. Sister Christy done such an awesome job teaching that lesson today. I, I hate to even try to, to say anything. But he, he loved uh, different ones. How many remember the demon possessed man? Anybody remember him in Luke, uh, Mark chapter 5? A thousand plus. Maybe, maybe as many as 2,000. Maybe 3,000. Devils in him. Jesus loved him. And, and Jesus delivered him. He, he loved uh, every man. He loved every man in this building. Every young man. Every old man. Us has done got old and probably should have retired 10 years ago. Probably should have sat down and let somebody else have this thing 10 years ago. <laughs> done got old. Can't hardly get her right now. I'm lying, man. Don't even think about taking my pulpit. <laughs> Don't even think about it. He loves every man, every boy, every teenager, every teenage boy, every teenage girl, every baby. Who's them babies at? He loves them. Even when they run up down the aisle and you can't catch them. <laughs> can't outrun him. I'm about the only one that outrun that little boy. And I don't, because who cares? He loves him. He loves everybody. He loves all that. He loves, he loves. God came by night. Said, Rabbi, we know that our teacher has come from God. Can't nobody do what you do except God be with him. He said, we know that. We understand that. He come by night, don't I? I got my opinion of why he came by night. I don't think he wanted them, wanted them big hot shot Pharisees to see him down there talking to Jesus. Yes, sir. Jesus said, except you be born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, how can I do that? I'm an old man. How am I going to enter back to my mother's womb and be born? He said, if you're not born of the water and spirit, you can't, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. He loved Nicodemus. He, I'm going to tell you a good one. This probably, probably would have been one of the hardest ones to love. Judas. Judas had the money bag. He was the one that said, why was this oil wasted? Why wasn't that oil sold give me the money, put it in this money bag? It, 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 we could put it to some good use. Yeah, we, know, we heard about your good use, Jesus. But you know what? Jesus loved it. And you know what the Bible said, Brother Stan? The Bible said he loved him to the end. He loved him to the day he tied that rope around his neck, threw it over a limb, pulled it back and tied it off, good and snug and jumped off a cliff. And the Bible said he bursted asunder and all his battles burst. Jesus still loved him. And he loves you. He loves me. He loves me every time I fail. Every time I make a mistake. He's right there. He's right there. Young ladies, teenagers, he loves you every time you mess up. Every time you act in a way you shouldn't act. He still loves you. And he's bidding you today, come. Let's do some things right. Let's get this, let's get this right today. No more guesswork. Get a picture of what he done for you. 
Get it in your eye, in your brain. If you ever do, things will be different. I'm gonna, Rebecca, come up here, sweetheart, would you, to this piano, and uh, I want you to play me something. I don't really care what. Uh, I just want you to play. Uh, he he loved a Samaritan woman that the Jews wouldn't have any, any dealings with. He loved her. He loved it. He didn't see her just as another shameless person. He saw her as a soul. He saw her converted. Jesus looked at every person the same way. He loved Simon. He loved Zacharias. He loved Mary Magdalene. He loved them all. He sees every soul the same way. I don't care if you if you got a multi-million dollars or if you can't, if it took two cents to get out around the world, you couldn't get out of town. He still loves you the same. If you put two or three hundred dollars a week in the offering, he loves you. If you ain't got two pennies to rub together, he loves you. It ain't got nothing to do with what I own. It ain't got nothing to do with what I don't own. When I, get right, when I get right with God, if I ain't got my two pennies, I'm gonna put one of them in that offering. I got things right in my life now. He loves me. Let me see what else have I got down here about who he loved. He loved Mary Magdalene. He loves every soul. He loved when he hung on the cross. He was hanging from every soul, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He cares about you. You say, preacher, I'm not where I need to be. Well, join the crowd. Join the crowd. And it, and a few days ago, I had a person standing and tell me, I'm just not what I need to be. And I wanted to say, sweetheart, I'm not what I need to be. I want to be more for God. I want to do more. I want to be a greater person. And not that I'm trying to do works to get me to heaven. I don't mean that. But I just want to be a better Christian. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I ought to be. But thank God, I'm not what I used to be. That means I'm not what I used to be. You see, I used to be a beer drunker. I used to stop every afternoon on my way from the sheet metal shop and get me a can of tall, a tall can of ice cold blood wine every day. Started off maybe one or two a week. Just, but I got work with him every day. If I didn't have a dollar, I'd borrow. I, I had to have that can of beer. Fridays, I get me right, right. Oh, why in the world? But I did. On Fridays, I go to the package store, cash my check, get a half a pint of, of, of uh, Jack Daniels, and take it home. Every week, I got worse and worse and worse and worse. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I give that Jesus. And when he did, I started pouring stuff out. My pastor never told me. Love me just like Jesus. Brady Williams. Here I am. My brother said I couldn't do it. Here I am. When the world looks at you like you'll never make it, you'll never be of that kind of life. Here we are. When the devil hits you with everything he's got and throws everything in hell at you, here you are. I want you to do that for me if you would stand. Brother Stan, I know you're not able, but I'm fixing to send somebody back there. Brother, Brother Mark, you want to come? You want to come? Okay, come on. Brother Mark, I want you to take this oil. I want you to pray for Brother Stan. Anybody else? That's it. Hold it. Let me run. Let's do it again. God has done a great thing for me. Come on, Roger. If you want to come up, you come on. Anybody else that wants to come? Come on, help Brother, Brother Mark pray right now in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody that would now get around these offers. Let's pray together. Everybody that would get around these offers.
worship the Lord again. Praise the Lord. God, so good to each and every one of us. I'm so thankful today that you all have come, that we've had the great privilege of being together, having this time of fellowship, strengthening one another, encouraging each other so that we can continue to go in the name of Jesus. So thankful that we've had a beautiful opportunity to hear a Sunday school message, hear a wonderful sermon, and Lord, we are blessed. How many of you believe that? We're blessed. I tell you, we thank God for the country we live in to have the great privilege to be here and to worship in His name, in the name of Jesus. We don't have to hide who we are. We can stand firm if we choose. And that's the decision. Choose Jesus. Beautiful sermon today. Beautiful lesson. Thank you all. Clap your hands to the Lord if you agree with that. Pastors asked me to close out the service, and so we'll do that today. Do we have... Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, we do. We have a birthday today. All right. Come on up here, young lady. She knows that you saw that smile. As soon as we said that, I saw that smile. 
All right, do we have any more birthdays or anniversaries that we need to recognize today? Birthdays or anniversaries? All right. Who would like to guess how old this young lady is? Go ahead. Ten. Is that right? All right. Let's sing happy birthday to her. Happy birthday, sweetheart. All right, thank you all for, for singing. Do we have any announcements today? Sister Hannah. We're going to skip tomorrow night's book study with the Bean Spring Break. We have Travels in the Town tomorrow. So, ladies, no book study tomorrow. Um, we're going to be skipping tomorrow. All right, ladies, the book study for tomorrow night is being postponed to the following Monday. So please keep that in your mind. It is spring break. Please pray for all of those around you, all that are in the congregation. Some will be traveling, and we just pray for each and every one. Also, the final chapter is the following Monday night for your ladies' book study, and so we encourage all of you to come and to take part. Do we have any other announcements today before we take prayer requests? Anything else that needs to be said? All right, any prayer requests over here? Anyone like to mention a prayer need this morning? Okay, here in the middle, prayer need. <coughs> sure, sure, okay. You said Lene? Lynette. Okay, we need to pray for Lynette. God will touch her. Anyone else here in the, in the center? Yes, ma'am. You're back. All right, we need to pray for our sister. Brother Stanley? I got two families. One is a Highland family. Yes, sir. Uh, that's, that's the trash. The other one is a working a woman family. Yes, sir. Daddy found cancer in him and they just gone. Mama had an MRI done yesterday after her surgery. And this yes. is Well, thank God for that. We've been praying for the woman's family. So. We thank God for that. Sir. Sister Vicki? We, we have a family we need to pray for. Remind me the name of the young lady that, that passed away. Standridge. Standridge. The Standridge family that we were praying for that and well, she passed away. So we need to pray for that family that the Lord will keep His hand on them, answer some questions, give them His comfort, His peace. And um, we know He will. So let's join them in prayer. Do we have any other needs here in the center anyone would like to mention to us all? Yes, sir. Your brother and sister. We sure will do that. Okay. Here, yes, ma'am. Uh, my daughter Megan, her dad, he's in the hospital on chemotherapy. Okay. Uh, he's not doing too well. Uh, and uh, Regina's mom, he is sick. You know, they had to take her all out. Yes, yes. How did oh, that went okay? I, or, okay. Regina's mother, we need we need to keep her in our prayer. Had a major surgical procedure this last week, and we prayed. Uh, Sister Regina brought that request before us here last weekend. We just need to keep that in our prayer. Anyone else over here would like to just mention a prayer need? All right, if you have a special unspoken need, just lift your hand. Let's do that together, and let's go to the Lord together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so blessed and privileged to have Your Word, to know it, to be able to be here together and to worship You in a spirit of unity, God, and we are so thankful. Lord, we bring these requests before You as a body, as, a, as an assembly here in Covington, Lord, and we bring it with faith, knowing... Yes that You are able to do all that we ask of You, Lord. God, numerous healing needs. Those that have been through surgery that need recovery, Lord. Those that have lost loved ones that need comfort, Lord, we pray for them. And God, we just pray that You'll touch all of these unspoken needs here today. God, there are needs of deliverance from addiction in this place. There are needs of financial blessing in this place. There are those that want to see those children to come and be a part of what we're doing here in Covington in Your name. And God, we pray You'll touch their hearts this week and bring them here to us. God, we pray that You'll do a miracle in the life of those that need a miracle and that You'll touch every heart and every life. God, we ask all these things because Your Word tells us to bring our request to You. And we do that because we know You'll hear us and that You will answer. God, we take confidence not in our situation, but in You. 
Because You're our Savior. You're our Healer. You're our Provider. And God, we pray as we depart this place that You'll bring us back again. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.